is the flowering of the Middle Ages, History 4330, Week 13. Uh, I'd like to start tonight with a reminder. This is the next to the last meeting of the class, and the third paper is due next week. There's a mistake on the syllabus that says it's due a week after, and it is uh, it actually is due uh, next week, the class day of week 14, not a week later. There are guidelines for the third paper in your readings book on page 175. It's the very last uh, um, page in your readings book. Okay, last week what we did was philosophic cats, and we talked about the essences of cats. <coughs> and the accidents of cats. And I brought my cats here tonight for you all to see. Uh, at my cat, these are the essences of my cats, Guillaume Leblanc and Richard Cour de Poulet and Sugar. And they are all essences. They are also accidents waiting to happen. And so, but we also talked about Plato and Aristotle, St. Augustine, uh, Moses Maimonides, St. Thomas Aquinas, and his Summa Theologica. And this is particularly important because the Summa is, is, is a, a statement of the confidence of the High Middle Ages, the idea that one can put all knowledge into one book, all human knowledge into one book, starting with the premise, does God exist, and arguing mathematically from one premise to the next in, in bringing reason, system, and order to philosophy. We also might mention St. Anselm of Beck, whom I've mentioned to you before. And he's an important step between St. Augustine and Moses Maimonides. One thing St. Anselm did was to revive reason. And he was the first to use reason to define God's existence uh, after St. Uh, after uh, St. Augustine. St. Augustine essentially set the parameters for the whole Middle Ages and nobody questioned him. People just looked to authorities. Uh, they would quote Augustine or, or quote the other church fathers if they wanted to prove something. It was Anselm who broke that mold and notice that it's in the 11th century that he wrote. He revived reason and he, for that reason he is called the father of scholasticism. So he's an important figure to insert in there as well. Now we're going to turn to a different subject tonight. We're going to turn to uh, church, law, state, and society, and we're going to talk about the church and the state. And as we're nearing the end, one of the things I want you to notice about Dr. Palmer's lecture is that in the very middle, uh, he brings in the appearance of the Black Death. The Black Death strikes Europe in 1348, and I really consider the Black Death the end of the medieval Renaissance, although people will disagree with me. And Palmer kind of uses this as a turning point in the government of England. He talks about it as initiating a new phase and a very positive phase in English government. So the Black Death has both its positive and its negative side. And so I wanted to bring this up before the lecture tonight so that you could, you could have your eye on it. Uh, you, could, you could be aware that the Black Death is going to initiate enormous changes. So we will look at it this week, and then next week, when we do our very last lecture, we will notice that the Black Death will come in the middle of that lecture as well. We're going to have a lecture on Dante before the Black Death, and then we'll have Chaucer after the Black Death. So the Black Death really changes things. Now let's turn to the lecture by Robert C. Palmer, the Cullen Professor of History and Law, and he'll speak to us on law, state, and society. I should mention first that I'm not just from the history department. I've got a joint appointment, so I'm also with the University of Houston Law Center. Uh, and that, that should clue you in right away that what I am is really a legal historian. And so most of what we're going to be doing tonight is going to have to do with law and history. You've been reading about William Marshall and his adult career uh, went through the reigns of Henry II, Richard, John, and 
and into the reign of Henry III. Uh, during this time, people put a lot of emphasis on loyalty and on military service and the social value of knights, uh, even though wars were often won with mercenaries. What I'm going to be talking to you about is not uh, that side that you see in William Marshall, uh, but rather a different side, a governmental side. Uh, over the last few years, I've been playing around with labels, uh, ways that we can conceptualize the, all the different kinds of things we know about society and express them in a short form. They aren't reality. Uh, we're going to be using uh, three different labels tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, medieval monarchy, medieval state, and a government of inherent, inherent authority. Uh, those just aren't reality. Uh, it's not something that they knew about. It's not something that they were striving for. It's not something that they conceptualized. Uh, this is something that a modern historian can look back and say, uh, here's, here's what we think about this concept. It's a label. Uh, it sums up s uh, certain perceptions that, that we can have of that society. And so I'm going to be talking uh, first about um, the medieval state. Can I have that first slide so that we can? This is, a, this is my first PowerPoint presentation, so I'm expecting something to go wrong. Uh, so first we're going to be talking about a feudal monarchy. Uh, and a, a feudal monarchy, we're going to say, uh, was a label that, one, that a modern historian can use for England between 1066 and 1176. That's from the conquest to the assize of Northampton. Uh, the, the way in which we're going to characterize what a feudal monarchy was is that uh, the primary mechanism for holding society together for governance uh, is personal relationships. Uh, so it's personal relationships that are the most important thing in thinking about governance in that society. There were state structures from 1066 to 1176, things that, that, that we will identify as uh, making it look like a state proper, uh, but, but they were distinctly secondary, uh, regardless of the fact that there were those state structures and, and those uh, state org organizations. Uh, it was really the personal relationships that, that held that society together. One can tell this uh, in a very real way because while there was a little bit of bureaucracy, that bureaucracy had really no effect on the subjects of England. It was basically a mechanism by which the king uh, uh, derived revenue. Uh, and one of the things that one really needs for a successful state is not just a bureaucracy, but a bureaucracy that gives sufficient benefits to a sufficiently large portion of society that it will generate loyalty. Uh, and England before 1176 had no bureaucracy of that kind. It had a money-raising bureaucracy, and the IRS, even today, doesn't tend to generate loyalty to the federal government. If you, I don't know if my uh, feelings uh, jive with yours, but, but uh, revenue uh, collection doesn't tend to uh, generate loyalty. And moreover, the exchequer, the, that revenue-collecting department, didn't interact with very many people. It basically interacted with sheriffs. And, and various estate officers of the king. Uh, and then what we're going to see as absolutely central to what we're doing is that uh, the kind of law that one has is, is normative or discretionary. Uh, even, even those not involved in law schools or in the lawyering profession uh, tend to think about uh, present-day law as a system of rules. Uh, it wasn't a system of rules before 1176 in any meaningful way, and we'll talk about why that was and, and how it could not have been otherwise. Uh, but those are the characteristics that we're going to tie to that label, a, a feudal monarchy, uh, a label that we're going to use for the period between 1066 and 1176. And what we're going to be going into after 1176, uh, building then to 1348, is what we're going to call a medieval state. And a medieval state is uh, a, a state in which you have a, a, a different primacy given to uh, what it takes to hold society together and to govern it. Uh, whereas with, a, uh, with the uh, feudal monarchy, 
there was a uh, primacy put on personal relationships, and that was basically what held society together. Uh, with the medieval state, uh, the state structures become primary. The state structures become primary, like courts, the, the, the king's court, for instance. Uh, personal relationships, those feudal relationships that you read so much about with William Marshall, uh, become secondary. They are, they are not unimportant uh, in the late 12th century. They remain very important, but increasingly, uh, state mechanisms uh, are the primary form that, that uh, governance takes. Uh, and then uh, there's a beneficial bureaucracy, a, a bureaucracy that provides benefit to the subjects of the country, uh, to a sufficient number of those subjects that it uh, really generates loyalty. And we're going to see how that might be. The conclusion to all that will be that, uh, in, a, in a conceptual way, uh, that the notion of justice changed from what it was before 1176. It was that was a, a notion that justice is somehow fairness, a normative idea of fairness, an idea of fairness that the populace would recognize. Uh, so a, a discretionary normative idea of justice. Two by 1215 and Magna Carta, you have two different conceptualizations of justice. Uh, one, that, that fairness conception of justice that we still have when we say that's just not just. Uh, but, but by 1215, uh, there's a different notion of justice that goes right alongside of that, that that we still have today, and that's following the rules. Even when the rules are doing something that, that looks normatively very strange. Okay, so that conceptually, that's, that's one side of what we're tracking, and we're going to tie uh, that uh, legal change into uh, the, chain, the, the change from a uh, feudal monarchy uh, into a medieval state. Another way one can uh, look at that, and we're going to be, part of what's going to happen is that you'll have law with rigid rules. That's part of having a bureaucracy, uh, a law with rigid rules, because the bureaucracy that, that we're going to talk about that benefits the people is, of course, the law courts. Another way that one can conceptualize or, or bring into focus that, that different, that what happens in England is by comparing it to France. France develops quite differently. Uh, part of what happens is that France in the reign of Philip Augustus, who was king from 1180 to 1223, drastically expanded the range of French royal authority, uh, multiplying uh, the uh, land over which the king actually had control. Uh, and, and to manage that explosive uh, expansion of royal authority, uh, the French king wasn't able to institute a central law that would apply to all of France. Rather, he adopted the mechanism, the strategy of sending out officials from the center who would go to the locality, so his own officials who would go out to the locality. But they would supervise local law. So the various provinces of France each had their own law. There was no common law in France as there was going to be in England. Uh, this is the uh, precise time period in England when one is getting the common law. And it's common because it applies to the whole country. In France, that was impossible. The explosive growth of French royal power under Philip Augustus was such that uh, they had to let the localities govern themselves by traditional law, just supervising it with royal officials. Uh, and that meant that in France, there were really no common concerns. If, a, a, if one law governs the whole country, then there are common concerns by all the subjects. That law and the changes that are made in that law and the administration of that law. Law can provide a common concern. And in France, there was no common law. And so France organized basically around loyalty to the king. And so when you read about France, you'll read a lot about the way in which the French kings portrayed themselves as saintly. And that, that is a large uh, element of the growth of the French state. Uh, and it isn't in England. It isn't in England. Now, when we talk about the medieval state, that is the label, the unreal, label, not a real thing, not something that they knew, but, but something that I'm tagging on to England before 1176. Uh, when we, we talk about a medieval state, we're talking about uh, personal relationships. And these are the things that you know fairly well from, from William Marshall. You have the king and then his barons and earls. 
on his bishops, all of whom have given homage to the king. Uh, and that homage is the king giving maintenance and protection in, re in return for uh, loyalty and service. Uh, those are personal relationships. And, and then the king had his own knights, and the barons and, and earls had their knights, and the bishops had their knights, and knights gave homage uh, to the barons and earls in return for maintenance and protection. Uh, and and uh, their homage given meant that they were going to be, uh, be loyal and serve. Uh, those, are, those are personal relationships. That doesn't, that doesn't mean best of friends, drinking buddies, uh, but it, it, it means that the, they weren't agents of their lords. They weren't agents. They weren't just officials. Uh, there was a relationship there, and it could be more or less close, but nonetheless it was a relationship with all the kinds of interaction uh, that one expects in a relationship. It can get better or worse. It can be broken off. Uh, that, th that is the structure that, that actually was most important in governing England before 1176. At the same time, there were all kinds of state structures. Uh, in, in England, uh, the uh, territorial divisions that one associates with uh, a state structure, in other words, not uh, not a governance that is over particular persons because they have given you loyalty, but rather over a territory, uh, had, had formed uh, before the conquest. And, and the uh, auxiliary state structures that, that helped govern England uh, were those that continued, uh, most of them. Uh, the king had a justiciar uh, who would take his place when he left the realm. Uh, he also had uh, central officers. Uh, chancellor and treasurer, uh, and local officers. The primary local officer was the sheriff. There's one sheriff per county. Uh, and, and below that sheriff, there were bailiffs in each of the hundreds. Uh, and these were, uh, the local officers were all territorially based. In other words, they just divided up the country into a certain number of counties, uh, each county with a sheriff, and each county divided into two hundreds or in part of the country, Wappen takes. Uh, but you don't need to worry about that. Uh, and, and each of those uh, uh, territorial units uh, had its own official. Now, be sure to ask questions here if you have them. We said that before 1176, there were no rigid rules of law. Um, and that's because the courts that they had is not that they didn't have law, but their law was normative. In other words, not rules. And we'll show why that was, because they were communal courts. And we're going to take one example of a communal court, which is the county court. Uh, the county court was presided over by the sheriff. Uh, the sheriff is the primary royal official in the county. Uh, uh, but presiding did not necessarily mean, and in this case certainly did not mean, giving judgments. So that in the court, the presiding officer only presided he did not give judgments. The judgment givers were called the suitors. And those were people like ordinary knights or magnates, barons or earls, uh, or the people, and I think this was usually the case, the people they sent in their stead. Uh, their their uh, estate managers uh, who would go and uh, defend their interests in county court. And so uh, you have something there that we do not see. In our courts, the judges give judgments that we, we associate those. Uh, in England before 1176, the presiding officer in a court did not give the judgments. Uh, you will recollect that, that King John, even after 1176, in his, in his own feudal court, uh, had to ask his magnates for a judgment against William Marshall and couldn't get it. Uh, the king, presiding in his own feudal court, at that point still was just a presiding officer. Even the king, in his feudal court, couldn't give the judgment. He had to get the judgment from those who attended. Okay? So it was like that in the king's feudal court. It was like that in the county court. It was like that in all the courts of England, except for, for perhaps ecclesiastical courts that weren't under the king. In that kind, yes. What was the reason for that? Does it go back to, uh, you know, like uh, this influence from the Anglo-Saxon Germans and the Vikings or, or what? Uh, I, I believe yes. Uh, 
part of it does. Part of it is that in a weak governmental structure, which is characteristic there, you really can't govern with strong imposition of authority. Uh, you really do have to kind of draw your authority uh, from, from the populace in some way, from the powerful people, not, not from the dirt farmers. That doesn't work. Uh, but, but from the powerful people. And, and so uh, that also provides a certain amount of protection. In a feudal court, like a baron's court uh, with his knights, uh, this provided a certain amount of reasonable protection because uh, not only did you have the, the Lord as the most powerful individual, uh, perhaps facing off against one of his knights, as, as John did with William Marshall, uh, the fact that the judgments came from the other people attending meant that you had some protection as a man. Right? It, so it, it kind of moderated the way in which power worked. It provided for a more consensual kind of justice. And, and actually, uh, that was what law was about. Uh, there were no professional lawyers. This, this is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, but but it, was, it was basically a communal court and not a court with legal specialists. Uh, the aim of adjudication was not to get to a judgment. And, and by the way, judgments are really not that important. If, if you were a lawyer and went out, it would be quite likely that in all your career, you would not really find a client who actually wanted a judgment. You would find all kinds of clients who wanted satisfaction. And if a judgment was the only way they could get it, that would be fine. Uh, but very, very few people actually want a judgment as such. They want satisfaction. Uh, judgments in, in communal courts were actually signs of failure. You did not want to have to go to judgment. What you wanted was to bring people together, to compromise in some way. So it's not real, those courts were not about the application of known law, rigid rules, to ascertain fact. Rather, they were about bringing people together by judgments coming from the community, presided over by sheriff or feudal lord or king. Uh, a very different kind of court than we're used to. Uh, and in that situation, since you have no legal professionals, you don't have a presiding officer that is, is giving the judgments, there's no opportunity for rigid rules of law, is there? Um, wasn't Ethelbert's law somewhat um, many times used back then as far as what the laws were and what the penalty was for breaking certain laws? One can certainly find statements of law, and one can find even uh, kings changing law. Uh, we have a, a, a nice edict from King Stephen uh, right during this period uh, in which uh, there is a change, in which he, he specifies a change to be made in, in uh, uh, how women are treated when uh, they are the heiresses. Uh, but what that seems to be is more normative. This is how it should be done. It's stated more uh, uh, forcefully than that. But as far as we can tell, uh, there was no sense that this is the law and it must be applied in all instances, a rigid rule. And that's necessarily the case uh, because there were no lawyers. It's not that they weren't, you know, they just didn't show up in these courts. It's that there were none yet. There were none. Uh, and so uh, that same conceptualization, if you, if you go back to uh, even something like Henry I's coronation charter, uh, Henry I's coronation charter says quite explicitly, these are the things that I'm going to do. Uh, but he didn't. He didn't. Uh, there, were, there were all kinds of specifications in the coronation charter of Henry I in 1100 that weren't carried into effect. And one is left either with saying, well, he perjured himself, or saying the expect there, there was just no idea of rigid rules at that point, and what was really happening was he was doing what he should do. When the, what he had said he was going to do didn't work, he did what he should do, which was govern well. It wasn't that he lied or had a, you know, kind of a party platform, uh, but there was no sense that laws are just, or that, that laws are kind of cookie cutters that go right down into society and are imposed on everyone rigidly. Everything is moderated through ideas of justice, which is fairness. Didn't the church have a great influence on how things were ruled back then? Uh, the church had some influence. In England, however, uh, even church courts were only taking a, an appellate structure in the reign of King Stephen. In other words, they were only developing into an appellate structure that would end in Rome during the reign of King Stephen. Uh, and they had limited power to affect the way in which barons and earls were actually governing the kingdom. Yeah? 
in the structure that you stated, it sounds like more of like a majority rules. Was there any protection for like any type of minority action that might be taken? Uh, I, I guess I deny both sides. Uh, there's certainly no protection for minorities. Uh, but it's not really majority rule. In any, if, even if you look at a committee today uh, and, and you have a, a committee chairperson who isn't a voting person, can that chairperson control the committee? If he's clever, he can. If he's a good manager, he can. Okay? The strong, and, and knights of a lord had a great interest in having a strong lord. He was the person who was supposed to protect them. So there was a lot of group interest in having a strong lord, but not a lord who was arbitrary or unjust. And so it's not really majority rule, as if you can run roughshod over your lord. You can't. Uh, he's, he's more powerful, and, and necessarily more powerful than his men. Uh, they, they depend upon him for protection. And so it's not really majority rule, it's that, it's that his power is moderated or modulated through the group. So it's not really majority rule, and, and, and yes, there's no protection for, for minorities. It's, it's sense of justice, isn't it? It's sense of justice. And so you, you don't have any rigid protections by law at all. There are no rigid rules. Moreover, uh, the kinds of proof they used in court were frequently things like group oath swearing. If, if you thought that I, had, that I owed you something, for instance, I would bring in people and we would swear that I didn't owe. Um, this, is, this is not a mechanism that would allow you to formulate rigid rules and apply them. It's just you owe, I don't, who swears. Uh, so that uh, a lot there relies on morality or sense of justice, uh, reliance on God in some sense. Uh, you're not looking at a system in which there could be rigid rules. It's n a non-bureaucratic society. Uh, a bureaucratic society will generate rules. This society before 1176 uh, was not bureaucratic. That changed. Uh, and it changed with, with an event, and that event was 1176 and the Assize of Northampton. It doesn't mean that if you looked at England in 1177 and compared it to England in 1175, that there would be a huge difference. The difference is subtle at first, and it grows. Uh, but the event that, that brought about the change was the Assize of Northampton. Now, the background of the Assize of Northampton is that it was uh, a political, a politically caused event. Uh, it wasn't people thinking about law or how nice it would be to have rigid rules of law. Uh, but in 1173-74, uh, Henry's son, whom he'd had crowned in his own lifetime as King of England, his successor, uh, revolted against Henry II. Henry II had, given, had had him crowned but had given him no power. Uh, Henry the young king didn't like that. Uh, the Angevins liked power, and particularly when they were crowned king, they expected to have some. Uh, most of the magnates who actually fought in that war uh, fought right alongside Henry, the young king, against Henry II. Uh, Henry, in fact, won, and he won with mercenaries. Uh, and when he had definitively won, he could have gone through and eliminated all those people who had fought against him. On the other hand, they'd given homage to his son. And standing by your homage obligation of service to your lord is not a bad thing, but revolting against Henry II was. Uh, Henry was actually quite merciful. If Henry II could do anything well, and he did many things extraordinarily well, he could manage people. Uh, he was a good manager of men. And so instead of, instead of casting out all his major magnates that had stood with Henry the young king, he set about to make sure that no one would revolt again. In other words, instead of dwelling on the past, he looked to the future. Yes? I think one reason why um, Henry II was so successful is because he made all the knights paid homage to him and not to their lords. Uh, no, this actually went back before Henry II. Uh, there was some kind of residual obligation. Uh, but you still don't have a situation in which the king can definitively claim the, the loyalty of the people. Uh, for instance, a, a, a one way you can see this is that through until the 1230s, into the 13th century, uh, the king felt that he could govern with consultation of 
the realm just by consulting with the barons and earls and bishops. Uh, they spoke sufficiently for their men that nothing further was called for. It was after 1230 that the kings really began to feel that they would have trouble if they didn't consult more broadly. And so th the, the primary mechanism by which the king was governing was not with a direct contact with the lowest level, with the knights, but rather through the barons and earls. So the uh, Assize of Northampton in 1176 now started out with a political purpose, and that was embodied in uh, Clause 4 of uh, the Assize of Northampton that we're going to be talking about in just a minute. But let's first talk about uh, what that word means, Assize, uh, because it has three different meanings. Uh, assize, first of all, uh, means uh, some kind of legal enactment. It's not a statute. It doesn't come out of Parliament, or it, but it's a... It's a legal enactment. It's a setting down of law. But it can also mean a legal remedy. That is a specification of a thing that the king is going to remedy and a way to do that. Okay, so it can either be a law, a legal enactment, or a mechanism of litigation, how I can sue you about something. Okay, or it can also mean, a third sense, a sworn panel of men, 12 men, good and law-worthy men, uh, whom, uh, who, who are the mechanism of proof in an assize, that is, the method of litigation, established by an assize, that is, a legal enactment. Okay, so you have all those meanings of assize. The assize of Northampton established the assize of Mort Dancester that used the assize as a method of proof. Okay. Uh, and the assize looks a lot like a jury. There, there are some differences to it, uh, but we're not going to go into those here. Uh, basically, it's 12 men sworn to tell the truth about specific issues. Uh, and for all intents and purposes here, that is like a jury. And writs. Uh, the mechanism for litigation had to do with writs. Uh, and, and we still talk about writs. We talk about the writ of habeas corpus, for instance. Uh, writs are nothing more and nothing less than a written order. Um, that is, it's a written down method of communication. Uh, this is how the king will communicate his wish to someone else, to anyone else. Now, there's a subset of those writs uh, that, that give jurisdiction, that have to do with litigation. Okay. Uh, and uh, that subset is what we're going to be mainly concerned with. And they're really important because the writs that began litigation were standardized. That means they were like forms that you bought. Just fill in the blanks. And this is important because if you have a, a, an assize that lays down an assize, that is a legal enactment that sets up a method of remedy uh, by which people can sue, and it's in a standardized form, everyone knows that if I fit those specifications in that form, I can sue in the king's court. Okay? So this sets down a categorical situation in which all people who can fit into those specifications can sue. People see this, how important that is? Okay? That means it's going to affect a broad portion of society, doesn't it? That means it's going to be able to affect a broad portion of society. And likewise, what, and here's what most historians focus on, they're returnable. In other words, uh, the writ goes out, say, to the sheriff, and the sheriff is obliged to return that writ. In other words, the, the, uh, the writ will tell him to summon uh, uh, William Marshall to come to the king's court on, on such and such a day. And the sheriff will get that piece of sheepskin and turn it over, and he will write on the back of it, I summon William Marshall to be at the king's court by these people. And he will have to take the writ physically and return it uh, to the king's court. Um, what, what that means, that doesn't sound terribly momentous, but what it means is that the king's court has a method of communication down to officials that will allow the courts to handle litigation from all across England from Cornwall to Northumberland, people will be able to sue in the king's court. 
and the King's Court can be right there at Westminster, handle litigation from the far ends of England, right there at the center. Okay? So you have a mechanism uh, developed by standardized writs that are returnable that will allow the growth of a single court that will handle litigation for all of England. Now, back to the Assize of Northampton that established the Assize of North Dancester. The Assize of Northampton was the set of laws laid down by Henry II when he first got back into England after he had one over Henry the Young King. Uh, its purpose was to settle England down. Uh, one of the mechanisms for settling England down that, that uh, Henry II developed uh, was the writ of Mort Dancester. Now, in a feudal relationship between lord and man, uh, it is strongest during the life of both. It is weakest when the man dies. The lord had undertaken to give the land and to keep the land to his man and to his heirs, but it's strongest to the man. There's no court yet before 1176. There's no court out there that's going to say the heir has an inheritance right. There just isn't. What that heir has, what the son has when his father dies, is the benefit of a promise made to a dead man, plus the sympathy of the other people of the court, who also have been promised by that Lord that they are accepted as well as their heirs. And if the Lord doesn't fulfill it to this dead man's heir, they're going to wonder what's going to happen to their family. Okay, so that feudal court is really very important for maintaining the security, for maintaining the security of, of land holding. But if you look at what kind of hold people had on land, it wasn't some kind of property right that inhered in a person against the whole world, which is the way in which we think about property. It was rather a claim against an individual. The son would come into the Lord's court and say, you promised that land to my father and his heirs here I am. Stand to your promise. That's more contractual, isn't it? You undertook, and I'm here to claim. I'm taking advantage of that promise made to my dead father. That's a claim against an individual, and not a claim, a relationship between me and the land, good against the whole world, protected by a bureaucratic court. You see the difference? It doesn't mean that people are insecure. What it means is that it's a society governed by relationships. The size of Mort Dancester was going to change that. Since the relationship is weakest at the time when the father dies, it's weakest at the time that the father dies, a lord who was expecting warfare, that is one of the magnates who felt that it was, the war was going to break out again with Henry II, would be tempted when a tenant died to build up, kind of like an arms race. Uh, and in that situation, if, if you had a tenant who died leaving a one-year-old son, no one-year-old son is going to be able to exercise power the way you're going to think you need it at this juncture when you think there's going to be war. And so you might be tempted to go by that one-year-old son and go to the dead man's brother or go to the dead man's daughter who can be married off to a knight who actually can exercise power. You may not go out of the family, and would, the, would your men think badly of that? No, you stood to your undertaking fairly well, and everyone knows that we're getting ready for war. So how do you solve that problem? Because once people start thinking like that, you're on a steady downward slope right into another revolt, aren't you? Henry was going to make sure that was not going to happen. And so what he did, was established the writ of Mort Dancester. And the writ of Mort Dancester uh, mandated that, if I can have that slide, uh, that if I can say that it was that my father, mother, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, okay, just those people, one of those people, the person who held last was my parent, my sibling, my aunt or uncle and that person had died seized, that is lawfully possessed, 
lawfully possessed. Within a short time, in other words, this won't go back a long time. It'll be the last, the last little while, a couple of years. And I am the nearest heir. Okay? If I can say all of those things, that the last tenant was my mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle. That person died seized, heritably, lawfully possessed within a short, a short time in the past, and I'm the closest heir. At that point, Henry II says, my court is going to make sure that you're put back on the land. You will get on the land. Now, what about wardmanship? Pardon? What about wardmanship? Wardman? Guardianship? Uh, guardianship is still there. Uh, your guardian would often be the person who would help you bring that. Well, no, that's not really true. It's your guardian who's probably not allowing you to get on the land. Uh, the person who is then, and we know this from, from the terms of the Assize of Northampton, uh, the person who's most likely not letting you on is not some horribly big knight who wandered into the neighborhood from France. Uh, it's probably your lord who doesn't think that you're an appropriate heir was trying to give it to someone else, yes. So that how much did this really affect the power of the barons to raise, um, to raise knights to revolt? If they were willing to grant land that they had no other tenant on, they could bring, they, they could do that. How often did this happen? I mean, was this It would depend on how large the lordship was. It would depend on how, lord, how, how large the lordship was. But this would prevent them from even thinking in that direction, wouldn't it? Uh, part of this is not how much it actually prevented them, but what it does to the psychology of the magnates. Can they prepare, can they even think about preparing uh, for warfare in this way? And the answer is no. Uh, this puts an end to that kind of, of uh, development of a, an, an attitude that it is going to devolve into a uh, revolt. Various things went along with that. Not it didn't need to happen like this, but in fact it did. Uh, immediately after 1176, we find that the king, in the king's court, not the king's feudal court, but, but in the king's court that handled the sizes of Mort Dancester, uh, that no longer was it communal. Now you had presiding officers who both presided and gave judgments. Okay. And we, we identified that as, as something that was really necessary for the development of rigid rules. Not only did they preside and give judgments, they began to specialize in presiding over courts. Before this, various members of the king's uh, entourage would preside over a court. Now you had three or four people, we're not talking about many yet, three or four people who actually specialized in presiding over cases. Okay. Um, so these writs promoted uh, a bureaucratic mentality. Uh, you, they were working on the basis of a particular writ, and that writ gave them jurisdiction. And since that writ gave them jurisdiction, uh, they had to follow the specifications in that writ. So if you were suing in an assize of Mort Dancester, uh, you had to be able to say that it was my mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle who died, seized, and demeaned as a fee in a certain short recent time in the past, uh, and I'm the closest heir. And the justices who preside over the courts are going to enforce that rigidly. In other words, if you come in and say, well, it's not really my aunt, really my first cousin, that's not good enough. So the, the standardization of that form actually promotes a bureaucratic mentality, as well as the specialization uh, of these people in presiding over cases. All of that amounts, as you see in that last part there, to the king's court protecting uh, some inheritance rights. Uh, this affected about, oh, maybe a third of England, about a third of England. Uh, but that's a significant portion of England who could say that kind of thing. Uh, and that means that you had a bureaucratic kind of law with some rigid rules that gave benefit, inheritance is a substantial benefit to society. No longer do you have to depend on the, the uh, maintenance of a relationship with the Lord. You can rely on the king's court for what's going to happen to your heir after your death. 
That's a substantial benefit then uh, to about a third of England. And so if you compare that to what we've said about the medieval state, uh, at this point, you can begin to say, without it being ludicrous, we're not talking about a mammoth state structure here, that the state structures are becoming important, that the personal relationships are becoming auxiliary, that there is a uh, bureaucratic benefit that government is giving to society, and that you are beginning to get rigid rules of law. So that you can see why the, the label that I have formulated for the medieval state begins to look like something one might talk about in 1176. Does people see what I'm saying? Yes? Yes? There was another aside uh, that became standardized, in other words, uh, fully formulated and operative, in 1188. And that was the aside of novel to season. Now, they spoke French, and so all these things are in, in medieval French and not in English. Uh, the aside of novel to season uh, was similarly a writ. In other words, it was, it was issued out of the king's chancery, um, uh, sent out to people. Uh, it used seals. Uh, the chancery had long used seals. You should know kind of what a seal looks like. Uh, this is a, a, let's turn this back. This is not a seal that was used for most writs. Uh, this is a seal of Henry II. It's not really a seal, it's a replica. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and this is a uh, seal of Henry II. Uh, this would go on uh, the writ of right, which would be the most important one, or a charter or something. It, it hung down uh, from, the, from the writ, uh, from, from the charter or the writ of right. Um, if, you, if you compare that to Edward I's seal, uh, which is around 1300, uh, so from the late 12th century to the late 13th century, you have a different, it's somewhat larger. And then if, if you compare then one from Elizabeth's reign, you can see that they get larger still. They're much more impractical as time goes on. Um, and, and how did you form a, how did they, how did they make a writ? If you keep it on here, because I'm going to turn my back to everything. Um, if the seal was formed basically by tearing that and you fold it over the sheepskin and then rolled it up, rolled it up, turned it over like this and, and put that torn piece around it and then sealed it with wax right there. Uh, and at that point, if you sealed it with wax and you had uh, uh, the imprint on it, the person that got it would know that it was genuine. When you broke it, it was no longer any good. But this was a normal writ that just went to the sheriff telling him what to do. Okay, and they looked a bit more compact than this, um, but uh, that's, that's the way in which uh, they handled the writ. Well, now the writ, of, yes? Was there a particular type of wax to use? Uh, I tried making it with candle wax and it didn't work too well. I'm a legal historian. I don't go into wax. Hallmark has, uh. <laughs> usually has some wax that you can use that for, for like invitations and stuff. Hallmark, yeah, gold crown stores. Okay. If, when we look at the assize of novel to season, then um, the assize of novel to season wasn't about inheritance from close relatives. It was rather about protection of uh, legitimate tenants, and it pro it allowed that. If you could say you were unjustly and without judgment deceased, season is lawful possession, deceased means taken out of lawful possession. Okay, so if you could say that I was unjustly and without judgment deceased of a free tenement within a short time in the past, and this was found by a sworn panel of 12 men in the king's court, then the king would order the sheriff to put you back on the land. This is, this is protection of, of uh, tenure, isn't it? This is really terribly important. When you look at the effects of that, one is a conceptual kind of thing. You could use the writ of novel to season 
if you could say that you had a free tenement, well, what is a free tenement? What is a free tenement? Uh, before the Assize of Novelty season, people had talked about tenements being free, but they were, in fact, on a spectrum. There were more free tenements and less free tenements, things that looked like really servile ten tenements. Uh, but it was a spectrum kind of thing. It was more or less free. With the size of novel to season, it becomes critically important to ascertain whether this tenement is, in fact, a free tenement or not. And so the king's justices had to decide very rapidly what a free tenement was. So they needed a legal category, didn't they? They needed the legal category of free tenement. And their determination was that a free tenement was any holding that was held for life or longer. In other words, if you had it for your own life or if you had it heritably, so it would pass down to your children. Okay. So for life or longer, held by precise services. In other words, like 10 shillings a year. Or 10 shillings a year and two days of work on your Lord's land. That's certain, isn't it? We're not talking about a night here, are we? Uh, it's certain. But if it's to labor on, on your Lord's land whenever he needs help, that's not certain. And that's not a free tenement. And so free tenement was a tenement held for life or longer by certain services, in other words, precise services, that aren't servile. Shoveling manure is not going to make it, no matter how precise you get. OK. That means that Access to these writs generated the necessity for the justices to define legal categories. It was crucially important to you to have a free tenement instead of an unfree tenement. Because if you had a free tenement, the king's court would protect your possession. This is an important matter, isn't it? And by the way, if you go to law school, uh, you will find that in the first year of property, right there in the first year of your law school course, you will still encounter that definition of a free tenement. It's still there. Uh, Anglo-American law really begins in 1176. Okay. Moreover, it started out, the Assize of Novel Season started out as something like ensuring due process in a Lord's court. In other words, you can't be thrown out unjustly and without judgment. You could be thrown out justly and with judgment. For instance, if, if you didn't perform your services. You could be thrown out by court process in your Lord's court for not doing what you should. And note, in that kind of situation, let's go back and think about Mort Dancester for a minute. What difference does it make to a Lord? We think about inheritance as huge, don't we? Huge, huge. What difference does it make to a Lord if he has to let the heir on because of the assize of Mort Dancester? If he's certain that without supervision from the king's court, he can get rid of a tenant who's not performing well. It makes some difference, doesn't it? But it's not the difference that we would make. The Lord still had the power to discipline his men. And he could discipline them by throwing them off. The Assize of Novel to Season, at the beginning, sets out to provide them with some kind of due process in their Lord's court. But by 1195, by 1195, it had gone much further so that a lord no longer dared, even justly and with judgment, to go ahead and discipline his man by throwing him off his fee. The assize of novel to season would prevent that. This is a bureaucratic mentality kind of run amok, isn't it? Uh, the, the king's court looked at that and, and, and decided that what, what kind of process is this? And they wouldn't go against the Lord. If, if the man sued his Lord and said this kind of thing, what would happen? The Lord would bring in his court, and the court would attest, yes, we did it, and we did all the summonses and all the distraints, and then we distrained by the fee because he had not paid his rent, or he did not come with his knights. And the king's court did everything right. He'd done the due process the Lord had. And the king's court would say, Go back and do it again. In other words, it would just be ineffective. 
And, and very rapidly, Lord stopped distraining by the fee, stopped taking the fee away from tenants. Okay. Now, when they do this, when they do this, what had happened in, with Mort Dancester in 1176 becomes more important, doesn't it? Now, when you inherit, you're not subject to the Lord's sole disciplinary power. You're much more independent, aren't you? So, novel to season increases the importance of Mort Dancester. The inheritance right of Mort Dancester had been important, but not earth shattering, until novel to season, which prevents lords from disciplining their tenants. People see that dynamic. How does this, how does this issue of uh, inheritance, inheritance, uh, inheritance taxes come into play at this time? What is the, does the Lord get anything out of this, uh, this uh, stability that he's creating through this uh, system here? Uh, actually not. Uh, part of what's going on here is that the dues that people pay on coming into their tenement, uh, one really shouldn't call those inheritance taxes, uh, it's called relief. Uh, the relief is, before 1176, an adjustable amount. If, if your father died with me on the battlefield, protecting my life, how much am I going to make you pay to get on his tenement? Not a whole lot. I mean, you're in really good grace. But what happens if you've been, a, well, I don't know what they would think about drunkard, uh, unreliable, and I didn't think, I, I had no idea how good you would be, and, and your father had been kind of mediocre, I might make you pay a lot. It's not really an inheritance tax, which makes you think of a set amount, right? It's, it's really a variable amount kind of buying your way in as much as necessary. Part of what's happening here is that it becomes more like a tax. It becomes more like a tax. The common law demands certainty in these things and unchangeability. That's part of what it means for going from a personal relationship to a property right, yeah. That's what I was just saying, that personal relationship is just being pushed farther and farther down and in Right, absolutely. Uh, before 1176, personal relationships were the dominant mechanism for governing society. After 1176, they become secondary. Still important, and personal relationships are still important now. They're still really important in the late 12th century, but the bureaucratic structures are becoming more important. They're becoming primary. Yes. Sorry I put you off before. I had to complete that thought. That's okay. Um, is this when we get terms um, fee simple, absolute, fee, and fee, entailment? Is this when all this, these kind of terms start up? No, at this point you're just talking about fee. Uh, you get fee simple by the late 13th century and fee tail by the late 13th century. Uh, this is a longer development. Everything doesn't just spring into existence all at once. Uh, at this point, you're basically talking about fees. Uh, you're talking about life estates and meritagium, uh, which is a, a specific kind of dependent tenure that you will give to a husband uh, of your daughter when they get married. Okay. Uh, but not, not, we don't have the full estate structure yet, by any means. It's not even a fee simple absolute, it's just a fee. You only need a, a fee simple when you have a fee tail to, to distinguish it from. Yeah. I must have missed this, but why is 1176 the magic year? That's the Assize of Northampton. And the Assize of Northampton provides the Assize of Mort Dancester. And the Assize of Mort Dancester, with the, with the volume of litigation it brings to the King's Court and the standardization, uh, specializes justices, gives justices that give judgments, provide for that bureaucratic mentality. And, and starts everything off. And that's, that's really the beginning of the common law. Yeah. They put a lot of power in precedents, you know, things no. like that. No. Um, precedent, well, some people will argue that um, precedent in law really attained force in the 20th century. Uh, it, it had some force in the 17th. Uh, but, but to use precedent, you really have to know what people have said before you. Uh, computers are a big aid in this. Uh, Lexis and, and whatnot allows you actually to find what people have, what other courts have said. Uh, but at this point, through, through the Middle Ages in, and through most of the 16th century, uh, they're not thinking in terms of precedent. They're thinking in terms of right reason about the law. Well, not, not, not that fluid. You've got the writs, don't you? 
and the writs tell you exactly how, you know, what, what the parameters of this action are going to be. That's not precedent because for every case there's a writ. You get jurisdiction over one case. Right? And it's the same darn writ with different names in it, you know, hundreds of times over, but you need your jurisdiction. You get the power to decide a case from one piece of sheepskin. Okay? And, and that piece of sheepskin sets the parameters for what you can do. Now the courts can manipulate under that. Right? But it's not just a free-flowing structure. Yeah? But it's not precedent. It's not precedent at all. It's right thinking about the law. And, and we, we see this more in the 15th century when, when the justices can't agree about what the law should be. More often than not, they'll just adjourn it from term to term, from year to year, until someone dies. You know, if, it, if, it, if they just can't agree on what the right thinking is, better just to delay than do something wrong. Okay, but it's not precedent. Uh, and we don't have courts that are, at this point, terribly anxious to make law, although they are actually uh, compelled to make law in quite a few instances. Okay, so the result of this, and this elides it a certain amount because we can't go into the full detail, uh, what one has by about 1,200 is property. If, yeah. Uh, and, and we can define property as a relationship between a person and a thing. Uh, contractual kinds of things are between people and people, aren't they? Between a person and a person. I agree with you to do something. That's contractual, isn't it? But property is between a person and a thing. My seal, so to speak. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's a relationship, not a personal relationship. You know, I'm not saying I'm friends with the seal. Uh, but, but I am claiming that I have this relationship with this thing, protected by a bureaucratic authority, as a right good, not just against you, but against the whole world. This is mine. Right? That's not contractual, is it? Land holding before 1176 had been contractual. It was me claiming against my lord. Now, property. A relationship between a person and a thing, protected by bureaucratic authority as a right good against the world, not a contractual right against one other party. And this was indeed a major benefit to about a third of society. We can identify several other things that happened um, with those writs. Um, by, oh, the first two or three years of the 13th century, 1202, 1203, um, secure inheritance by women. Secure inheritance by women. Uh, we really can't tell, but, but in the 1170s and 1180s, uh, we know that if a wife inherited from her father, her husband did homage for the land. If a wife inherited from her father, the husband did homage for the land. A woman couldn't do homage. Homage meant that you were going to be doing night service. Uh, and a woman couldn't be a knight. And so when a, woman, uh, when a wife inherited from her, anyone, father say, her husband did homage for the land. But if her, if her husband did homage for the land, whose land is it? And the answer, more likely than not, and we don't have a good answer on this, but the answer, more likely than not, is that it was the husband's and that it would go to the husband's heir if his heir was different from hers. Yes? Um, normally inheritance, did it go to the firstborn son? Yes. Oh. yes. Uh, but if there, was, if there was no son, it would go to a sole daughter or be split among daughters. Now, by, just a minute, by, uh, 1202, 1203, one begins to find the specification that the husband holds in right of his wife or does homage in the right of his wife okay. so that it is really hers and it will go to her heirs. Yes? Didn't they have anything like, um, like later on in England they had the law of Coventry when the woman and the man got married? Coventry. <clears throat> Coventry, that's it. Uh, the, the land went to the woman. But that's, the man. well, it didn't go, the, the, the woman was covered by the husband. That means that while they were married, the male got to control the land, right? That didn't mean it was his. He got to control it during his life. After his life, her rights revived. 
And that's the second point. The second No divorce. There is separation uh, from, from bed and board, but those have to be specially negotiated. What's the difference between that and a dowry? Uh, dowry is land that, that you take into, that the wife brings into the marriage with her. It's not inheritance. It, it, I mean, it's, not, it's, not, it's not necessarily inheritance. It's not inheritance, inheritance at all. It's land that she brings into her as a gift coming from her side of the family. Dower is, <laughs> let's not, let's, I mean, one, one can get into these uh, and, and we'll spend the rest of the night doing that. Um, but by 1214, it's clear that a widow can recover her land that her husband has alienated during the marriage. You're married to a man. He has control of the land while you're married. He alienates the land to someone. It's good. That alienation will stand until the husband dies. When the husband dies, the wife can bring what they call a writ of entry, qui and vita, and she will get the land back. No compensation to the buyer. If the buyer has any remedy at all, it's against the husband's heir. But the widow gets her land back her inheritance, her meritagium, uh, that she can get back. It is her land, and she will not have to compensate anyone for it. And if there's no compensation, she's not the one that's out. It's the purchaser that's out. Okay? Um, all of this is concentrating power over land in the hands of tenants, isn't it? Now, the corollary of that is that control goes along with that. Land is the primary form of wealth in that society, the primary form of wealth. When people gain more control over that primary form of wealth, you would expect something to happen economically. And from 1180 to 1220, there is the second largest inflation in pre-modern England, a 300% inflation, which doesn't sound a whole lot to, to us over the course of 40 years, but to them it was huge. And the reason for that inflation is that the greatest form of wealth had become more liquid. People could use it for security. Before 1176, could you use your land for security? If you did that, your lord would kick you out. That's a personal relationship. You can't put, could I, could I sell a personal relationship? That doesn't make any sense. Can I use a personal relationship as, as, a, as security for a loan? Not really. Uh, it would have taken the lord's consent. By 1215, you don't need it. You can use your land for security. The impetus there toward inflation is monumental. Okay, so that, that gives you some kind of measure about the kind of change we're talking about in society. The second largest pre-modern inflation in England. Now, when you, when you look then at Magna Carta in 1215, uh, you have to consider Magna Carta in the, in the context of all the things we've been talking about. The king's court had been regulating relationships between, say, barons and their knights, or between knights and their free tenants, but not between the king and his magnates. It was the king's court, after all. It wasn't going to regulate the king. So the king's court had been regulating everyone else, but not the relationships between king and his magnates. And the common law had been generating common concerns, shared ideas, participation in juries, accustoming people to different kinds of ideas. And the ideas that they were being accustomed to had to do with rigid rules, ways in which lords should and had to operate in regard to their tenants. Justice had become a notion not just of fairness, although that survived, there was now a different sense of justice, which was following the rules laid down by those writs and that the justices had developed in addition to those for implementation of those writs. You follow those rules, no matter how rigid they are, and that's justice. So you have there the two different ideas of justice that we still have. Now, when you combine that background about legal ideas, 
with the background, the kind of the political background of Magna Carta, uh, that John lost a great deal of land in France to Philip Augustus, uh, that losing that land in France meant that John was more often in England, and John perplexingly liked to be in courts and to give out justice, and he apparently wasn't bad at it in, in the courts, but having the king right there in court looked much more powerful than just dealing with his justices. And that rubbed people the wrong way. They weren't used to the king always being around in his courts. You can probably have class on just the Magna Carta for a whole semester, but wasn't one of the major contributions or uh, the greatest uh, thing that Magna Carta was that the king was under the law, not above the law? We're getting to that. We're, we're going to see why that is. Okay. Um, and then John had controversy with Pope Innocent III that resulted in the Pope excommunicating John and putting England under interdict so the sacraments couldn't be celebrated in England. That's a substantial detriment to a monarch. Um, and then John's character wasn't all that admirable either. He wasn't magnanimous. He didn't look like a real lord. He wasn't generous. Okay? Now, what did Magna Carta do? Well, in, in various ways, it made the common law more accessible, and that's extraordinary. The barons who had lost a lot of their control over men weren't about cut. This didn't go out and say, OK, we're going, to cut mag, we're, going, we're going to cut the common law back. They rather said, we're going to make it more accessible. We want circuit justices out there to handle the assizes. But it also applied rule-oriented ideas between king and lords. That is, the relief was going to be set. Widow's rights were set. All those discretionary things between king and king, the king and his tenants were going to be rigid, just like the common law had made the relations between earls and their knights. So a property kind of idea, even for magnates, with the idea that the king had to abide by the common law, as regulated by a special court. And they even set up a special court in Magna Carta that would be able, of, of the king's magnates, that would be able to turn around and distrain the king, take his castles until he stood to right. You know, in the judicial process against the king. This just inevitably devolved into civil war. And when, and, and when Magna Carta was reissued under Henry III, who was just a child whom no one had anything against, that clause disappeared. Uh, but the idea that the king should actually follow the rules of the common law is the primary message of Magna Carta, that the king should treat his lords as his courts had made them treat their men. That the king is under the law. In other words, you, what your courts have done to us, we think you should do to us. You should be no better than People see why Magna Carta is so important then, and how it really rests on what's happened in England since 1176. We're not going to finish uh, this first part. There's some things that I really have to talk about. We're going to start, uh, and we'll get interrupted with the break and, and then go on. Uh, but let's talk for, let's at least start with criminal law. We're going to talk first about the presentment jury. That is, how you find out who the potential criminals are. Um, most, most criminal law before 1170, 1166 was, was really feud, self-help criminal law. In other words, you do it yourself. Um, in 1166, to catch those people who weren't caught by the feud, by, by self-help, uh, Henry II had uh, justices go around, preside over groups of local people, sworn to present those people who were suspected of crimes. Just present a list. And we know that this went on in 1166 and 1167, uh, again in 1176, 77. Uh, but in 1194, it became permanent. Okay, so that we th this is going to grow into the grand jury. Okay? But at this point, they're not evaluating evidence. Nothing is presented to, to them. It's just a presentment jury. They, they are brought together, and they are supposed to present a list of those people who are suspected of all the crimes that have happened in their county. Those people who were presented would then face trial. And trial was by the ordeal. Okay. 
the ordeal was a nice invention. Uh, the ordeal of water took place by a priest blessing a pool of water. The accused was tied up, and the rope would come off his back with a knot on it at a certain distance. They would then throw him in. Um, and if blessed water received you so that you sank to the level of that knot, uh, you had been received by the blessed water, so you were clearly innocent. Uh, if you floated, you'd been rejected. And at that point, you were hanged. Uh, this is a nice method of uh, determination of or innocence. Uh, what we're interested in it for, though, is the question they were asking. Even today, our question in criminal kinds of things is odd. We ask, is he guilty? Not, was he guilty? They ask the same question, is he guilty? Is, present tense. What does that mean? It's not a question of past fact, did he do it? That would have been easy enough to ask. It was really asking the question, how does this person stand before God right now? Has he repented? Is he dangerous? If you, if you have gone to confession, people had real worries about allowing an accused person to go to confession first. Because of course, if you go to confession, you should be standing in right with God. And that's going to circumvent the whole purpose of a criminal trial. What they were asking was, are, how do you stand before God right now. And that's the only question God would really be interested in. He wouldn't be interested in, did he do it? That's a question of fact. Interested in a moral question. How do you stand? This is morality, isn't it? This is asking the moral question. How do you stand before God now? Are you deserving of punishment? It's not backward at all. Well, what, what happens is they move out of this. And we'll, we'll see uh, precisely how they move out of it. The ordeal worked well. Uh, and what happens is we're going to uh, substitute the trial jury in place of the ordeal. And we'll do that right after the break.